Suppose a painter decided to set a human head on a horse's neck and to cover the body with gold colored feathers, combining limbs so that the top of the lovely woman came to a horrid end in the tail of an inky fish. When invited to view the piece, my friends, could you stifle your laughter? This is how the Roman poet Horace begins his Ars Poetica. Uh, it's a long-ish, not terribly long, uh, poem about, uh, well, the craft of poetry, as the title would have it. Ars means essentially to translate to craft. It's the connection between art and craft. Uh, and you can see throughout it, he's laying out advice for how to be a poet, how to, uh, how to write good verse. He's addressing this to one or more members of the politically connected and very powerful and wealthy uh, Piso clan. Uh, and it, it, while he addresses his listener directly, he's writing this in the form of a kind of epistle, a letter, um, to them purportedly, ostensibly, as instruction in how they can become poets. But it's a very uncertain relationship between the writer and the uh, listener, which I think is part of what he's getting at here. Throughout, he is trying to lay out a very, uh, a fairly simple view of poetry that um, is driven by common sense. He is a, uh, a great poet of um, the mean. The, uh, in the terms of you know, just the simple, uh, correct, uh, socially acceptable uh, commonplace. And that doesn't mean that he is not exceptional in any way. He actually is. But he is, uh, he is writing in the, the great Roman tradition of appropriateness, of propriety. Uh, where every line has to have a certain grace but not be ostentatious, where art itself should have a function as well as mere ornament. Um, he, he's writing out of this uh, tradition that sees art in fairly simple terms, and yet he, uh, he does this in a way that is remarkably nuanced and, and uncertain. He rails against the irrational, um, as you can see in that opening, where he's imagining you know, a, a poet who would combine wildly disparate elements uh, and expect anybody to take that seriously. Um, he does not. Uh, he's saying that a poet should try and appropriate um, recognizable, realistic, and logically coherent elements into a organized whole. Uh, it should never make anyone laugh, necessarily, um, or at least not for that reason, for it being outlandish. He's not a big fan of shock art we can say. Um, <clears throat> Painters and poets alike have always enjoyed the right to take what risk they please, I know. I grant that freedom and claim the same in return, but not to the point of allowing wild to couple with tame or showing a snake and a bird or a lamb and a tiger as partners. The irrational has no place. Everything has to be reasonable, not to a point. Uh, meaning, or not to the point of allowing this, saying, well, okay, everything needs to be within certain bounds. Outside of that, you're getting into the ridiculous, and that's what he's always warning against. Writers must pick sub a subject that suits your powers. Uh, again, a sense of propriety, but think about that also. Uh, how do you know what your powers are as a young writer, whom he is purportedly writing this for, as a young artist, how do you know what is in your powers unless you try? And how do you uh, grow unless you try and exceed those limits, unless you challenge those limits a little bit? 
Uh, he's a little bit vague on that. It's a little uncertain. And that's an early warning shot in the poem that things might not be all what he's presenting them to be. Uh, arrangements, virtue, and value reside, if I'm not mistaken, in this, to say right now what has to be said right now, postponing and leaving out a great deal for the present. Again, selection, deliberation, appropriateness. These are the, uh, these are the characteristics that he keeps returning to, trying to uh, establish a sense of how a young poet should work with his materials. And uh, he, he, he is relatively flexible in certain things. He gets into a little point about, uh, about language and how certain words come and go. They, they will fade out of usage and then sometimes come back. And that the poet's job is to select selectively among that. Uh, many a word long dead will be born again, kind of vocabulary uh, uh, reincarnation, if you will, uh, will be born again and others which now enjoy prestige will fade. Sense of the rising and the falling and the easy going about it. It's like, oh, these things happen. Very much in the Roman character, very much in the classical character of trying to maintain an even reasonable calm in the face of great change. Hmm. For a poet writing in the era of Caesar Augustus, uh, leading up to Caesar Augustus was a time of a great, great change. And keeping an even keel through all of that has some benefits. Um, but again, if usage requires it, a sense of practicality. Well, you know, if, uh, if the word is good, use it. Um, everything that, uh, uh, everything Rome really makes has a purpose, has a use. There's very little that is strictly ornamental in Roman society. There is a, uh, a, a pragmatic streak in that culture that is very dominant. Um, everything has its appropriate place, propriety of form, ease, something that allows the viewer to not get jostled out of uh, uh, expectations. When you go to see a, uh, a, a work of art or open a book or listen to a song or something like that, you have certain expectations and you want to maintain within that. You don't want to be jostled out of them. Uh, this is Horace's advice. Stay within those lines. Correctness is not enough in a poem. It must be attractive, leading the listener's emotions in whatever way it wishes. When a person smiles, people's faces smile in return. When he weeps, they show concern. Before you can move me to tears, you must read yourself. That's curious. Before you can move me to tears, you must grieve yourself. There's no faking. There's no trying to whip it up out of language what you're not feeling genuinely on your own. There's a kind of uh, honor code there. Uh, but also, significantly, the notion of success in a poem is then socially determined because it's up to the listener, or the viewer, or whomever is taking in the art. Uh, they need to validate the poem for the poem to have worth. So, interesting dynamic there. He's saying that it has to be social. Um, form follows function. Everything has its place. It's a, uh, it, it, this is a, a litany, this poem, of uh, relatively simple advice that is sometimes maddeningly opaque. Uh, if you are a young writer and you're trying to figure out how to be a better one, this can be a really frustrating guidebook, so to speak, because some of the advice is so, um, uh, 
in specific. Uh, he, uh, he sort of wanders, he's very digressive. He puts out this image of the poet who is very laid back, very relaxed, carpe diem, sees the day, enjoy the good life, don't get too excited. And his text reflects that. It has a sort of ease to it, and it goes around, and it takes little side routes, and then goes off over here. Uh, he starts out talking about poetry, and he sort of segues into um, drama, which he never even really wrote. Uh, he was known for much shorter works. He talks a little bit about epic poetry, but he doesn't write that at all. Um, he never wrote drama and he talks about that and but again always the advice is make it appropriate make it you know don't go crazy with it make it rational uh, if a scene belongs off stage don't push it on many things aren't suitable for eyes suitable again a sense of approach appropriateness uh, aren't suitable for eyes which an actor soon appearing can vividly describe for Medea shouldn't kill her sons before the audience, or evil Atreus cook human guts in public view. Uh, this is from the uh, translation by Jacob Fuchs. Um, this is a slightly older one, but it, he's always bringing you back to that sense of keep it within a reasonable mean. You don't want to have, you know, in the case of Medea, you don't want to see her kill her children. All of the power of that is when it happens off stage but you put it on stage and people will be revulsed the re the 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 explicit um nature of that imagery will repulse people it'll be too much you will push too far and they will lean back from it and you will have lost them this is his advice again and again and again but now we're into drama which isn't the same as poetry they're both they're written you know they're both written in verse uh slightly different uh, uh, uh different meters uh most roman drama that he's talking about would be uh, uh would be what is it iamic trimeter and he generally writes in uh what is it uh dactylic hexameter, if you really want to know these things. Uh, but he is going over there. But you think about the nature of those two things also. Critics have pointed out uh, theater is more social than poetry. Poetry, even in this age, tended to be enjoyed by relatively small groups of people. Uh, not so much reading solo on, on, their, uh, on your own, uh, as much as just enjoying a uh, like a small group hearing someone sing, it was still a performance generally, but it was a uh, a more private thing. There were people who would read in private as well, obviously, but it was it was smaller groups. But theater could hold, you know, uh, a good sized theater can hold hundreds of people, and so it's a very different. Uh, medium and it's it's a more social medium because it's more exterior it's about human beings characters interacting uh, in words and actions and public uh, public performance it's a very different world so we're getting into that realm of it being not so much about art anymore as society because he's talking about bothering people He's talking about irritating people or making them uncomfortable. And this is where I think it's really starting to go off the rails as a writing manual. Because again and again and again, he's not talking about art, except in the most simplistic terms. But what he seems to be saying to this relatively politically powerful family that they need to be controlled, that in life, not just in art, they need to think about staying within the boundaries of uh, proper behavior, not going outside the lines, not being irrational, for one thing. Um, and he sees this as perhaps good advice, because after um, a century or so of great, great um, hostility at which 
these people were very much uh, close to. They were very connected to. I believe uh, the father of uh, this, the patriarch of this family that uh, that he's writing to, supposedly, is the father-in-law of Julius Caesar. And what he's writing is, while on the one hand, it's you know moderate uh, artistic criticism, it's very good political advice. Stay in your lane, keep your head down, don't be ostentatious, don't be challenging, uh, keep things simple, calm, reasonable, attractive, but useful. Don't rock the boat. Don't get crazy. Because as the poem moves along, you see this development of uh, hostility towards anything uh, that makes life difficult, that pushes people, that is aggressive. Uh, it seems to want to make everything just calm down just a little bit. Calm down, stay relaxed. The first word in this poem, in the original Latin, is human, humano. And you see him tossing out through this very circuitous and seemingly very informal style of his, uh, different suggestions about how to be a human, how to live comfortably within your society, and how not to bother people too much. Um, they don't want to be bothered, you don't want to bother them. Why would you want to bother them when they don't want to be bothered? Stay in your lane. And after tracing these very elaborate uh, patterns of how to be a poet, but how to be a good citizen, a good human being, it starts with human at the beginning and the very last word at the end after tracing out all the possible ways that you could be a good citizen or by contrast imply be a bad citizen a good artist or a bad artist a good person or a bad person starts at human ends with the last word leech